Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Today's episode is called, The 1947 Murder of the 22-Year-Old Black Dahlia. On the morning of January 15, 1947, a mother taking her child for a walk in a Los Angeles neighborhood stumbled upon a gruesome sight, the body of a young naked woman sliced clean in half at the waist. The cut was cleanly done so that none of the internal organs being touched except the intestines. The cut through the backbone was very cleanly done. There were other cuts done on the body, including the removal of one breast. There was some speculation that the murderer had some training in dissection of bodies. The body was just a few feet from the sidewalk and posed in such a way that the mother reportedly thought it was a mannequin at first glance. Despite the extensive mutilation and cuts on the body, there wasn't a drop of blood at the scene and her body thoroughly cleaned before being positioned at the spot on Norton Avenue, indicating that the young woman had been killed elsewhere. They found brush fibers in her cuts and those were sent off to determine what type of brush it was. They believe this brush was used to clean the body off prior to moving it to be dumped in Lover's Lane. Later the bristles were found to be of plant fiber bearing the characteristics of palm tree fiber, which were used in the manufacture of inexpensive brushes. Marks around her legs, wrist, neck, and right thigh showed that she was tied with a rope or wire prior to her death. The police believed she had been bound and tortured before her murderer carried the body to Lover's Lane or Norton Avenue for disposal. The ensuing investigation was led by the L.A. Police Department. The FBI was asked to help, and it quickly identified the body in just 56 minutes. In fact, after getting blurred fingerprints by a sound photo, a primitive fax machine used by news services, from Los Angeles. After the discovery of her body, the Los Angeles Police Department began an extensive investigation that produced over 150 suspects but yielded no arrests. The young woman turned out to be a 22-year-old Hollywood hopeful named Elizabeth Short. She was 5 foot, 5 inches tall, and about 115 pounds. Black hair, green eyes, very attractive, bad lower teeth, fingernails chewed to the quick. Later dubbed the Black Dahlia by the press for her rumored penchant for sheer black clothes and for the Blue Dahlia movie out at that time. Her fingerprints appeared twice in the FBI's massive collection of more than 100 million fingerprints were on file at the time. Although most suspects in the case were male, authorities did not rule out the possibility of a female killer. One theory held that, because Short had checked her baggage, including her clothing and cosmetics, a week before she died, she must have been staying with another woman who presumably would have lent Short the essentials during the intervening time. Another theory was that the assailant bisected Short's body because he or she was not strong enough to move it in one piece. One of the first people to confess to the murder was a woman Air Corps sergeant stationed in San Diego. Authorities took the confession seriously enough to investigate and found it groundless. First, she had applied for a job as a clerk at the commissary of the Army's Camp Cook in California in January 1943. Second, she had been arrested by the Santa Barbara police for underage drinking seven months later. The Bureau also had her mug shot in its files and provided it to the press. In support of L.A. police, the FBI ran records checks on potential suspects and conducted interviews across the nation. 
Based on early suspicions that the murderer may have had skills in dissection, because the body was so cleanly cut, agents were also asked to check out a group of students at the University of Southern California Medical School. And, in a tantalizing potential break in the case, the Bureau searched for a match to fingerprints found on an anonymous letter that may have been sent to authorities by the killer, but the prints weren't in the FBI files. Who killed the Black Dahlia, and why? It's a mystery. The murderer has never been found, and given how much time has passed, probably never will be. She was last seen January 9, 1947, when she got out of a car at the Biltmore Hotel. At the time she was wearing a black suit with no collar on a full-length beige coat, probably cardigan style. She had on a white fluffy blouse, black suede high heel shoes, nylon stockings with white gloves on. She carried a black plastic handbag about 12 by 8 inches, in which she had a black address book. She was known to readily make friends of both sexes and frequented cocktail bars and night spots. She was last seen leaving a car there and went into the Biltmore Hotel. Elizabeth Short was born July 29, 1924 in Hyde Park section of Boston, Massachusetts. She was the third of five daughters born to the Shorts family. Being a native of Boston, she spent her early life in New England and Florida. She then relocated to California, where her father then lived. It is commonly held that she was an aspiring actress, though she had no known acting credits or jobs during her time in Los Angeles. Some of the male suspects, like the publisher of the Los Angeles Times from 1945 to 1960, as a suspect in the murder. In a complicated scenario involving multiple perpetrators, Wolf claims that Chandler impregnated Short while she was working as a call girl for the notorious Hollywood Madame Brenda Allen, which led to her murder at the hands of gangster Bugsy Siegel. A Hollywood nightclub owner at whose home Short lived, either as a paying boarder or as a guest, on several occasions between May 1946 and October 1946. Hansen's girlfriend, named in Toth, shared a room with Short in this house, which was near Hansen's nightclub. Remembering that Short had checked her baggage in the Biltmore Hotel, which contained her personal toiletry things, making police think that she was staying and sharing personal items since she had none at the time. Short called Hansen from San Diego on January 8th, making him one of the last people known to have spoken to her. The Los Angeles County District Attorney's files indicate that Hansen made contradictory statements to authorities about the nature of this conversation. An address book embossed with Hansen's name was among Short's belongings mailed to the Los Angeles Examiner after her murder by someone claiming to be the killer. The address book belonged to Hansen, but he had never used it. Short had been using it as her own. The DA's files also indicate that Hansen had tried to seduce Short, but was rebuffed. He was one of the first serious suspects in the case, and he was still a prime suspect as late as 1951. Hansen was also linked to three other suspects each of whom was a medical doctor, Dr. Patrick S. O'Reilly, Dr. M. M. Schwartz, and Dr. Arthur McGinnis fought. Hansen died of natural causes in 1964. No charges were ever brought against him. He had no criminal record and no known history of violence. LAPD Police Chief William Wartons told the Los Angeles Examiner that there was absolutely no case against Hansen. 
A doctor who was acquitted in December 1949 led the LAPD to include Hodel, a physician specializing in sexually transmitted diseases, among its many suspects in the Dahlia case. Police put Hodel under surveillance from February 18 to March 27, 1950, to ascertain whether he could be implicated in the murder. In the surviving transcripts of microphone recordings, Hodel was heard making highly incriminating statements. One statement was in 1950, when he was saying supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore, because she's dead. Maybe I did kill my secretary. The secretary referred to was Ruth Spaulding, who police had previously suspected of being murdered by Hodel in 1945. He was present when Ruth overdosed and burnt some of her papers before police were called. The case was dropped owing to lack of evidence but documents were later found that indicated Ruth was about to publicly accuse Hodel of intentionally misdiagnosing patients and billing them for laboratory tests, medical treatment, and prescriptions not needed. Hodel's son, former LAPD homicide detective Steve Hodel, believes Short may have been one of his father's patients. The last person seen with Elizabeth Short before her disappearance, Manley was the LAPD's top suspect in the first few days after the killing. After two polygraph tests and a sworn alibi, Manley was set free. He also identified Short's handbag purse and one of her shoes after they were discovered in a trash can on January 25, 1947 several miles from the murder scene. Manley, who had been discharged from the Army for mental disability, subsequently suffered a series of nervous breakdowns and claimed to be hearing voices. As a result, he was committed to Patton State Hospital by his wife in 1954. He died on January 16, 1986. The coroner attributed his death to an accidental fall. During the autopsy, they found ligature marks on her ankles, wrists, and neck, and an irregular laceration with superficial tissue loss on her right breast. They also noted superficial lacerations on the right forearm, left upper arm, and the lower left side of the chest. The body had been cut completely in half by a technique taught in the 1930s called a hemicorporectomy. Hemicorporectomy is a radical surgery in which the body below the waist is amputated, transecting the lumbar spine. This removes the legs, the genitalia, internal and external, urinary system, pelvic bones, anus, and rectum. It is a major procedure recommended only as a last resort for people with severe and potentially fatal illnesses such as osteomyelitis, tumors, severe traumas, and intractable decubiti, in or around the pelvis. The report stated that very little bruising along the incision line, suggesting it had been performed after death. The lacerations on each side of the face, which extended from the corners of the lips, were measured at three inches on the right side of the face and two and half a inches on the left. The skull was not fractured, but there was bruising noted on the front and right side of her scalp, with a small amount of bleeding in the subarachnoid space on the right side, consistent with blows to the head. The cause of death was determined to be hemorrhaging from the lacerations to her face and the shock from blows to the head and face. On January 24, a suspicious manila envelope was discovered, addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers, with individual words that had been cut and pasted from newspaper clippings, 
Additionally, a large message on the face of the envelope read, Here is Dahlia's belongings, a letter to follow. The envelope contained Short's birth certificate, business cards, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen embossed on the cover. The packet had been carefully cleaned with gasoline, similarly to Short's body, which led police to suspect the packet had been sent directly by her killer. Despite efforts to clean the packet, several partial fingerprints were lifted from the envelope and sent to the FBI for testing. However, the prints were compromised in transit and thus could not be properly analyzed. The same day the packet was received by the examiner, a handbag and a black suede shoe were reported to have been seen on top of a garbage can in an alley a short distance from Norton Avenue, two miles from the crime scene. The items were recovered by police, but they had also been wiped clean with gasoline destroying any fingerprints. On March 14th, an apparent suicide note scrawled in pencil on a bit of paper was found tucked in a shoe in a pile of men's clothing, by the ocean's edge at the foot of Breeze Avenue in Venice. The note read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I am too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that, or this. Sorry, Mary. The pile of clothing was first seen by a beach caretaker, who reported the discovery to lifeguard Captain John Dillon. Dillon immediately notified Captain L. E. Christensen of West Los Angeles Police Station. The clothes included a coat and trousers of blue herringbone tweed, a brown and white t-shirt, white jockey shorts, tan socks, and tan moccasin leisure shoes, size about 8. The clothes gave no clue about the identity of their owner. Police quickly deemed Mark Hansen, the owner of the address book found in the packet, a suspect. Hansen was a wealthy local nightclub and theater owner, and an acquaintance at whose home Short had stayed with friends. According to some sources, Hansen also confirmed that the purse and shoe discovered in the alley were in fact Short's. And Toth, Short's friend and roommate, told investigators that Short had recently rejected sexual advances from Hansen and suggested it as potential motive for him to kill her. However, he was cleared of suspicion in the case. In addition to Hansen, the Los Angeles Police Department interviewed over 150 men in the ensuing weeks whom they believed to be potential suspects. Manley, who had been one of the last people to see Short alive, was also investigated but was cleared of suspicion after passing numerous polygraph examinations. Police also interviewed several persons found listed in Hansen's address book, including Martin Lewis, who had been an acquaintance of Short's. Lewis was able to provide an alibi for the date of Short's murder, as he was in Portland, Oregon, visiting his dying father-in-law. A total of 750 investigators from the LAPD and other departments worked on the case during its initial stages, including 400 sheriff's deputies and 250 California State Patrol officers. Various locations were searched for potential evidence, including storm drains throughout Los Angeles, abandoned structures, and various sites along the Los Angeles River but the searches yielded no further evidence. City Councilman Lloyd G. Davis posted a $10,000 which would be equivalent to $131,058 in 2022, reward for information leading police to Short's killer. After the announcement of the reward, various people came forward with confessions, 
most of which police dismissed as false. Several of the false confessors were charged with obstruction of justice. By the spring of 1947, Short's murder had become a cold case with few new leads. Sergeant Finus Brown, one of the lead detectives on the case, blamed the press for compromising the investigation through journalists' probing of details and unverified reporting. In September 1949, a grand jury convened to discuss inadequacies in the LAPD's homicide unit based on their failure to solve numerous murders, especially those of women and children, in the previous several years, Schwartz being one of them. In the aftermath of the grand jury, further investigation was done on Short's past, with detectives tracing her movements between Massachusetts, California, and Florida, and also interviewed people who knew her in Texas and New Orleans. However, the interviews yielded no useful information in the murder. While the case of the Black Dahlia is still unsolved, there are many theories about who could have committed this crime. A large number of people have actually come forward to confess to the crime, but most of these confessions have been proven to be false. Some crime authors have made a link to the Black Dahlia murder and the Cleveland Torso murders, which took place between 1934 and 1938. The murder of Jean French in Los Angeles on February 10, 1947, has also been discussed as possibly linked to Short's murder. At the time of the investigation, Leslie Short was considered to be the prime suspect, but he was never brought to trial because of clerical errors. This, along with other details of the case, has led some theorists to believe that the Black Dahlia's murder was never solved because of a police cover-up. Letters to John Edgar Hoover of the FBI stated that the case has been quickly hushed up and apparently all covered up. No effort was really made to bring the culprit to justice. It was said that the case does not come within the investigative jurisdiction of the Bureau so we are referring all this information to the appropriate local authorities. This case is still to this day unsolved. Stay tuned again next week for another episode of the True Crime Tales. Be safe and see you again next time.